Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running national syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology turn podcast. Everyone, welcome in the program. I hope that you're doing well and you are ready for, well, as Ralph pointed out, the last show of the year that we're going to have with Ralph. So um, yeah, you know, it's uh, the, the holidays are upon us. Everyone, I hope that you are, you know, getting in the spirit, getting in the mood and uh, ready for, you know, uh, a little bit of a break from us because uh, the last week of the year, we traditionally always take off. Uh, so we're going to keep up that tradition. It's a, it's a great tradition. I recommend everyone do it. And uh, with that being said, the following, so uh, I, we looked at it January 5th, is when Ralph will be back with more stories and more pick-me-ups because, you know, um, yeah, this is always a lot of fun. So we're going to keep it going right on into the new year. So with that being said, ComputerAmerica.com, that's where you'll find everything, including past shows, future shows, show notes, articles, all that and more. Ladies and gentlemen, you can find that at ComputerAmerica.com. We have a whole section dedicated to Ralph, of course, where you can find his past shows. And as I always like to point out, his shows are very, uh, like some, some are very time sensitive. You know, uh, we'll, we'll be covering a product w with a company. It will just be launching. They'll be doing like a, you know, like a big launch event, whatever. Uh, those are fun, but you know, you go back and watch those six months later and you know, it is what it is. Uh, but with Ralph, these stories are always cutting edge. So I think we just uh, covered an article uh, last week where the payoff for NASA won't be until like 2038 or something like that. Uh, so relevant until then, I'm sure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the program. Uh, we're going to bring Ralph on in just a moment, but um, just want to remind everyone real quick, one more time, CES will be uh, the next big event that Computer America does, and that will be in the early part of January. So look forward to that coverage. Uh, you know, on the week of like the, what, 7th through like the 14th, like that whole week will be kind of CES events. So everyone keep an eye on that. Now, with that being said, Ralph's been waiting oh so patiently in the wings. Let's go ahead and bring him on. Ralph, welcome back onto Computer America. How you been? I'm doing great and happy holidays to everybody. And hopefully a better new year is ahead of us. I know it will be in science and technology. That I'm not worried about. But the rest of the world, well, here again, what you and I do every Friday is lift the spirits along with the holiday spirits. We're going to give you a reason to feel good about the coming new year in areas of robotics, medical technology, sustainable energy technology, transportation advances, space research, physics, you name it across the board. If it's a cool trend or a, a view of what's coming in the future in the areas of science and technology, that's what we do every Friday. And as Ben mentioned, we have show notes for every show. The show notes give the highlights of the stories that we're going to talk about with links and images and sometimes video links as well. So please come out to ComputerAmerica.com, go up to the Ralph Bond tab at the top, and you'll see the show notes for today's show. And it's going to be a really interesting show today. Yeah, you're not, uh, you know, uh, you're not starting out light with, you know, some kind of fun little gadget or robot, <laughs> although this would be a very fun gadget. This one's going to get a little uh, uh, heady, I, I, I guess I can say. Uh, yes. What is this about? I, it, you know, I, I, I kind of glossed over it and kind of went over my head. Uh, <laughs> someone made a brain. So, hey, that's cool. <laughs> well, yeah, this is very kind of a Star Trek -y and uh, sci fi. And, and just, of course, the headline immediately grabbed me. I first saw it at Popular Science, the headline being researchers fuse lab grown human brain tissue with electronics. What? And then in the show notes, I have some other links, including the link to the Indiana University, which is the source of this research. So this is just boing, really weird, weird mm -hmm. stuff. But 
kind of interesting to say the least and profoundly implicative of where we might be going decades from now. Maybe we'll see. So the opening here is your biological center for thought, comprehension and learning bears some striking similarities to the data center housing rows and rows of highly advanced processing units. But unlike those neural network data centers, the human brain runs on an electrical energy budget. On average, your brain functions on roughly 12 watts of power compared with a desktop computer at 175 <laughs> watts. Uh, and that's some um, for so, today's. Some would say a article, little bit less yeah. than 12 watts sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for today's advanced artificial intelligence systems, that wattage figure can easily increase into the millions. So what they're doing, the author here is setting the stage. Um, he's saying that you know, our brains can run on such a small amount of power as compared mm -hmm. to a neural network data center. Of course, that kind of makes sense, but it is sort of interesting how little power is required for the old noodle here to work. It, 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 and to, to me, that kind of speaks yeah. to like the efficiency of the brain, but also like, uh, what is it? According to YouTube videos or documentaries, whatever I was watching, it's like, you know, everything that our bodies do is just, you know, kind of eat food, consume food, and then process that <laughs> energy for the brain to work. So yeah. they're saying that they can, you know, re really cut a lot of that out. And, you know, when it comes to just the brain, 12 watts is not a lot. So, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So so with that mm -hmm. setup in mind, right, this issue of brain, very little power, data center, huge amounts of power, we all know that. So knowing this, researchers at the Indiana University Luddy School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering believe the development of cyborg, does that sound familiar? Cyborg biocomputers could eventually usher in a new era of high powered intelligent systems for a comparative fraction of the energy costs. And they're already making some huge strides toward engineering such a future. So that's the motivation. Can we get a lower power computing solution for the years to come the when data centers are going to be such a huge part of oh, our lives they I, already are i get it so so it's not that they're digging at you know humans for using such low energy it's, it's that humans are so energy efficient and they want to bring that to computing okay i get it see that's the setup and that's what their yeah. motivation is so it's not to create scary frankenstein like <laughs> cyborgs no that's not what's going on here <laughs> so as detailed in a new study published december 11 so very recently in the outlet called nature like Electronics. And by the way, folks, in the show notes, I embed links. Sometimes the author does and does not embed links. I embed links and I also add tutorial uh, elements too as well. So that's why the show notes are so important. So again, as, as mm -hmm. detailed in a new study published December 11 in Nature Electronics, the Indiana University team reported that they had successfully grown their own nanoscale brain organoid in a Petri dish using human stem cells. Wow, that's weird enough as it is. After connecting the brain organoid to a silicon chip, now the article doesn't get into a lot of details about that interconnection, but anyway, uh, after connecting the org organoid to a silicon chip, the new biocomputer dubbed BrainAware, that <laughs> sounds like an appliance from the 1950s, I love it, dubbed BrainAware, was quickly trained to accurately recognize speech patterns as well as perform certain complex math predictions. Wow. Okay. As the news outlet New Atlas explains, and I embed a link to that article too, researchers treated the BrainAware as what is known as an adaptive living reservoir capable of responding to electrical inputs in a, here's the key, non-linear fashion, while also ensuring it possessed at least some memory. Hmm. Wow, let that sink in. This, this, this gets even better, guys. Simply put, the lab-grown brain cells within the silicon organic chip function as an information transmitter capable of both receiving and transmitting electrical signals. Now, here's a qualifier. While these feats in no way imply any kind of awareness or consciousness on brain aware's part, <laughs> they do provide enough computational power for some very interesting results. And get, fashion your seatbelt. This, this is really cool what's coming up now. To test out brain aware's capabilities, the team 
converted 240 audio clips of adult male Japanese speakers, why Japanese, I don't know, into electrical signals, and then sent them to the organoid chip. So 240 audio clips of adult male Japanese speakers, uh, then sent it to this organoid chip, this this brain plus silicon combo, right? Mm -hmm. within t Within two days, the neural network system partially powered by brain aware could accurately differentiate between the eight speakers 78% of the time using just a single vowel sound. That's impressive. Like I, at first I was like 78% kind of whatever, but a single vowel. So just saying, yes. Oh, and it would be able to differentiate between eight different people. That's yeah. very impressive. Yeah. If both of us were A E I O U, if you both of us just say one vowel and it could distinguish between us, that's that is very impressive. Mm -hmm. And then, but wait, there's more. Next, researchers experimented with their creation's mathematical knowledge. After a relatively short training time, Brain Aware could predict a Henon, that's H E N O N map. And I wasn't familiar with this, and it's way over my brain level. <laughs> While one of the most studied examples of dynamical systems exhibiting chaotic behavior, sounds like my grandchildren, <laughs> Henon maps are a lot more complicated than simple arithmetic, to say the least. And there's a little diagram here about it, the uh, process that they, they use. So time out, a little educational. I had to do this because they were going, what? What is Henon map? In mathematics, the Henon map is a discrete time dynamical system. It is one of the most studied examples of dynamical systems that exhibit chaotic behavior. Now, now I totally understand, right? Uh, no, it's still like, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's like a and, and if you're watching the video portion which uh yeah, yeah. thank you um there's like a visual representation <laughs> where they kind of just start out with like a bunch of scatter points and they squeeze it bend it <laughs> squeeze it bend it and of course you know to a lay person uh this is just what it looks like to me just that squeezing and bending over and over really does put all those points in a random position so you know doing yeah. that you know doing that a thousand times I guess the computer is going to be able, or, you know, uh, brain aware is uh, going, to, going to be able to predict that much better than traditional systems. It's, uh, yeah. you're right, though. This is way over my pay grade. Oh, gosh, yeah. And it goes on to say, in the end, brain aware's designers believe such human brain organized chips can underpin neural network technology and possibly do so faster, cheaper, and less energy intensive than existing options. Folks, I want to stress something here. When we talk about being the I'm the science and trends correspondent for Computer America, this one is really, really glimmer of the eye, first little twinkle light of this kind of research. This is the very beginning. And so where does this go? We'll find out. But again, I want to stress this. So reality check at the end here. There are still a number of hurdles, duh, both logistical and even ethical, because we're talking about stem cells, right, to clear. But although general biocomputing systems may be years down the line, researchers think such advances are likely to generate foundational insights into the mechanisms of learning, neural development, and the cognitive implications of neurodegenerative diseases. So stop. This is not only just for number crunching so your your Amazon fulfillment center can do something better or smarter or what. No, it's also going to cross over potentially into many fields of uh, computing and artificial intelligence, et cetera. Now, I added my own personal reality check outside of the article. And I thought to myself, well, okay, so you've got this little nano <laughs> brain organoid. and But wait a minute. I know my brain needs oxygen and nutrition and so forth and so on. How do you maintain a, such a system, right? It's one thing maybe to do it in a lab on a very small scale and so forth and so on. But how would you, uh, would you have to have the, the, the brain organoids floating in some kind of bio soup that's going to keep them alive? I, that part was the part that I went, cool experiment, but wait a minute, how do you make this really deliverable on a large scale in a practical way so i i and i will say from the outset i do not know uh <laughs> obviously <laughs> this will not be just slapped into a computer um you know, this oh. would be a whole new system that would have to be yes. developed and that kind of thing but the first thing that of course came to my mind was uh as usual is futurama and i think you know 
you know, maybe something like that. Just keep them floating in a jar, um, you know, as, and maybe give them little personalities so they're easier to interact with, you know? Yes, um, yes. So maybe the classic Futurama head in a jar oh, gosh. is what we're heading towards. Yeah. So. That's funny, man. So who knows? Who knows? But still, th- you're right. That, that one that one is uh, certainly different. And uh, obviously, you have, a, you have a history with Intel and, you know, uh, the developing, uh, I'm sorry, the development of the processor that we all, you know, use today, you're very familiar with. I like the processor. They're still somehow squeezing, you know, juice oh, out gosh, of that. Yes. Like it is down oh, to, yeah. uh, I, I think Intel has been talking about their adventures into like the angstrom level. Like it's, mm. it's, it's below nanometer and we're going into like angstrom, uh, meter. Yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, super, super, super fine detail. Um, but you know, a completely different technology is, you know, obviously also a welcome, uh, yeah. idea because, you know, yeah. I yeah, think processors yeah. as we know them can only go so far. Although, you know, I say that, but every year they do something new. So I don't know. Well, right. And and alternatives to traditional silicon mm-hmm. you know, chip making is is also very actively being pursued yes. around the world. So the, the next decade is going to be, I just hope I'm around to see all this <laughs> you, stuff. You will be. You will be. You're, you're, and, you're already half bionic as it is. You're 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 good. Yeah, there you go. And, and, and now they're making a new brain. It, it, you, Ralph, you're going to have all the parts. You just got to put them together. It, it's going to be Sign me up for that new brain. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the so story number one, story number two. And, yes. uh, and, and this one is, um, you know, going uh, kind of in the same vein, but instead of creating something for computational reasons, this is going to be something for, uh, you know, technology, but in like bioreactors and, and lab yes. room meat and stuff like that. So, yes, let's talk yes. about story number two. Yeah, this is a good one, and it's a it's a news item that came out a few months back here in September. But when I came upon it, I thought, this is so sure. interesting and so important. I wanted to share it regardless of the fact that it's not a brand new story. But the headline here is Profuse Technology, that's the name of a company, achieves 80% faster muscle growth for lab-grown cultivated meat. And this whole area of uh, bioreactors and so forth to, to cultivate meat to potentially offer the world a, a non-animal um, uh, slaughtering alternative way to get chicken and beef and so forth is a really hot field being pursued all over mm-hmm. the world. Uh, and of course, as we all know, there are climate change issues with the whole idea of having herds of cattle and billions of chickens and all this sort of thing. So that's part of what's going on here in the motivation for looking for alternatives. Right. And this story comes from the Jerusalem Post because Profuse Technology is an Israeli-based company. And it's a real, but again, a really interesting story. So here we go. Uh, so Profuse Technology, a front runner in the field of muscle tissue growth, has made significant strides that could have far-reaching implications for the cultivated meat and life science sectors. The company's latest developments have led to an impressive 80% reduction in the time required for muscle growth, achieving maturity in just 48 hours. That's super fast. So, Yeah, that's remarkable, isn't it? This acceleration not only quickens the growth process, but also enhances the protein content of muscle tissue by a factor of five, providing a healthier and more protein-rich alternative to traditional meat sources, of course, farm, you know, cattle ranches and chicken farms and all that kind of stuff. So a little more explanations, which, which I loved about this article. So traditional cell cultures are typically grown in a flat, two-dimensional environment. In contrast, 3D growth methodologies, which Profuse Technology uses, involve creating a three-dimensional environment where where cells can interact and grow in a more realistic and physiologically relevant manner. Mm -hmm. And this approach, the 3D approach, aims to mimic the complex structure of natural tissue and organs, allowing cells to develop and mature in a manner that closely resembles their behavior in a living organism. Huh. It, it's in the con- yeah. and, and, and j- just real quick. Uh, in yeah. my mind, if it helps anyone out there, it's kind of the difference between like let's say sawdust and a piece of wood. Uh, you know, sawdust mm. is, is like a you know a lot of little particulates, and you know for the muscle matter that's going to be one like it's technically wood, but there's a big difference between mm. a plank of wood and sawdust. You know, it's yeah. yeah. 
that's an excellent that's a, that's a fun analogy it's kind of a great way to visualize what we're talking about that's a good one so in the context of muscle muscle tissue production 3d growth methodologies involve providing an environment where muscle cells can form intricate three-dimensional structures similar to the muscle fibers found in traditional meat mm -hmm. this method enables the development of muscle tissue that not only grows faster but also exhibits characteristics more akin to natural muscles so a little side note my my personal side note i want to stress this profuse technology did not invent 3d printing of lab grown meat that's not what we're saying but you know, many other outfits are developing this worldwide. The key to this news nugget is the speed of production they have achieved, achieving maturity once again in 48 hours, as we said at the outset. So I want a little truth and lending qualifier here. And then what the article does, it's so great. It goes into explaining how 3D growth of lab grown meat works. How does this work? Well, first, there's something called scaffolds. And scaffolds are supportive structures or frameworks made from biocompatible materials. They serve as the foundation for cells to attach to and grow upon in a three or in three dimensions. In muscle tissue production, scaffolds are designed to mimic the extracellular matrix found in living organisms. Wow. Okay. Next, second, the second ingredient, microcarriers. Microcarriers are small, small particles that can be suspended in a culture medium. They provide a surface for cells to attach and grow within a bioreactor or culture vessel and are particularly useful when working with large-scale cell cultures as they increase the surface area available for cell, cell attachment and can enhance the efficiency of nutrient exchange. There's a lot of going mm -hmm. on here. If you if you, you go and look and look up and read more about bioreactors, and you'll see the fuller picture of this. This is quite remarkable. In the context of muscle tissue production, microcarriers can be engineered to support the growth and organization of muscle cells within a 3D environment. So, Ben, the takeaway for me is um, my family for many many years has been basically vegetarian. Although when I go to parties and stuff, and my wife's not looking all snag a little. You know, <laughs> salami hors d'oeuvre or something yeah. like that uh but and my doctors say believe me buddy the diet your your family put you on all those years ago has saved your life but anyway I, I digress for the world where we have to find potentially alternatives to traditional farm grown uh meat production because of its impact on the climate mm -hmm. and this is a terrible terrible news for farmers i guess for people in livestock production it's not great news but on the whole balance of looking at the big picture of where are we going with climate change, what do we have to do, and so on and so forth, if we could grow meat and it would be indistinguishable from uh, farm-grown meat sources, it could change the world. And so this is where the, all these researchers around the world are headed, and this is just one example in, from Israel, as it turns out. Well, I may be completely wrong, but it's like all the farmers have been replaced by like Tyson by like multinational corporations that yeah, you know raise well, um, you yeah. know a million cattle a year, um, yeah. But but yeah. but I would say even like Ralph to me like even farmers would say, oh I can get meat without having to raise and kill you know these animals that are obviously intelligent. Like uh, if you ever want to know how intelligent you know one of these animals are, just ask a farmer. You know they'll be one of the first ones to tell you you know kind of what they do is uh not the best thing in the world not even from like a environmental standpoint from like an ethical standpoint um yeah. and then of course the environmental one as well that is you know right. obviously a huge issue uh in its own so this is like the best of both worlds you still get the part that everyone loves without ever having to you know pollute the environment or you know kind of kill you know a, a living creature it's yeah. it it's the best middle ground i think that we're gonna have for a long time so uh, I, I know, like you said, this came out two months ago, but even so, uh, for those kinds of advancements and, you know, the fact that this is, this research is going to be built upon and, you know, maybe in scaffolds, it's going to be built upon and it's just going to get better and better. Uh, I'm glad that you yeah. brought it back up. Uh, I, I, yeah. very, very cool story. I like that a lot. <laughs> and of course I got to get away from that picture cause it looks like prosciutto. So there you go. Uh, so story number two, story number three. <laughs> 
uh, we're yes. going to get a little bit different. And, you know, the, the images alone uh, are, you know, very, uh, very cool looking. Um, but obviously, this is a little bit different take on a solar farm. If, if anyone has seen out there seen solar farms, I'm sure you're going to, you know, kind of describe it uh, in the article a little bit. But it's like a ton of like mirrors, like solar panels and mirrors that all focus uh, the sun's uh, radiation heat into one central point that then hits like a boiler and it boils water turns a turbine and you know that's kind of a traditional solar farm uh you know kind of powering kind of thing this design that you found is much different and uh yes turns out works at night too i don't even know how that works so story number yeah three. well we'll find out and this i got from an outlet called new atlas which is a wonderful outlet by the way headline here double action solar tower promises clean energy all day and night and we're going to find out how that works and you're absolutely correct typically speaking when someone says solar tower to me and solar energy you're right it's a field of mirrors all focused on it on a top of a tower where it's going to you know raise the temperature so high and generate steam and drive a uh you know drive the production of electricity and so on and so forth mm -hmm. fine 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 this is a very different kind of thing and it requires right. an environment that not everyone's going to have. If you look at the image there, you can see that you're showing the audience right now. And by the way, folks, if you're listening to us as a podcast, I cannot stress this enough. Please come out to computeramerica.com. Go to the Ralph Bond tab, get the show notes so you can see the pictures, get the links and dive in deeper if you want to. But this is a whole different ball of wax here in terms of a solar tower. It so, does seem here we go. that you need an environment that uh, it, yeah. it, it looks like you need to be on Dune, essentially, from just well, from the, yes. the image. But yes, yes, yes. that's right. <laughs> so researchers in Jordan and Qatar or Qatar, sometimes it's pronounced that way, uh, have come up with a remarkable design concept and I want to stress concept for a twin technology solar system capable of generating clean energy 24-7. This double action design promises more than twice as much energy as a standard solar updraft tower. Now, when they talk about updraft tower, that's not the tower you and I were talking about where the mirrors are focused mm. on, a, on a point. They're talking about a, a traditional um, thermal uh, passage of air up a shaft and it's driving turbines, uh, turbines, oh. pardon me, turbines. <laughs> and so there's a diagram in the show notes showing you a standard solar updraft tower. Basically what you have, like the image that you showed at the beginning, you have a huge, huge area that's covered and it's heating up the air and then that air gets channeled into a single updraft tower and it drives uh the turbine so right. turbine so that's what we're talking about with this kind of thing so as the name suggests the twin technology solar system combines two tower style technologies into a single design a solar updraft tower and a cooling downdraft tower these are integrated into a single tower, it should be called complex or system, with the updraft tower coming up through the middle. So that's what the images are showing here. The solar updraft system works by heating up the air at ground level. And you can see in the image you're just showing now, mm -hmm. it's this huge kind of like uh, ground level umbrella, if you want to call it, the structure that's covering the ground. And it's it's got a, a roof that it enhances the heating up of the air inside or just below. That's what's going on here. Yeah, it's, the and, solar and, 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 yeah. and just for everyone out there, like it, it, it seems like the, the heat's going to come from the sun that's you know, normally just going to hit the ground and be absorbed or right. away or whatever. Right. Uh, but they're channeling that heat into a darker material where it's kind of shaded and cool. And like you said, heats up that dark material. And then that causes the air underneath to heat up and then go up the, yes. the shaft. So, it, uh, exactly right. Never heard yeah, of that. Yeah. But, but uh, I, I wonder if any of these are like, like if a solar updraft tower is already being used, or is it just like a design? I, I, because you know, I've never heard of that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. In hmm. fact, at the end of the article it talks about how this uh, pulling this off would be require a huge amount of territory for one thing is this image implies, <laughs> right? It also seems to me as you in inferred probably um, specific to areas like deserts and so forth and so on that could really support this kind of thing. And it talks about because they're so huge, the proposal, these massive, gigantic structures would be very expensive to do, and therefore investors find them kind of risky. So I gave giving away the very end of the story right. here, but but there are a lot of things going on here. And that's a great point. I don't think the world has seen a combo 
uh, tower structure like this was combining the uh, maybe if they had double the output they would be more attractive for investors and you know more attractive as, as a design so yeah. it makes sense yeah makes so, sense. but this is some just some interesting speculative research mm -hmm. and proposals and computer simulations as well so excuse me going on it says a solar updraft system works by heating up the air at ground level, then using the fact that hot air rises to funnel that air up a tall tower with turbines in it. The air is heated under a large roof covering a vast ground level collection area made from a greenhouse type material designed to trap as much heat as possible. A cooling downdraft tower, on the other hand, forces air downwards to turn another turbine. In this design, proposed by the researchers in Jordan and Qatar or Qatar that's accomplished that fact is accomplished by spraying a fine mist of water into the ambient air at the top of the tower making it both cooler and heavier and sending it downward huh the proposed twin technology solar system design places an updraft tower in the middle and surrounds it with 10 downdraft towers running around the outside huh, such that it can operate in both updraft and downdraft modes simultaneously. Now in computer simulation testing using local weather data, and you can imagine since we're talking about jo uh, Jordan and, and Qatar, this is very hot desert situation, mm -hmm. right? So in simulation testing using local weather data, the team estimated that such a system could generate a total of around 753 megawatt hours of energy annually with the external downdraft towers running around the clock to deliver about 400 megawatt hours and the updraft tower working more efficiently under the hot sun to contribute around 350 megawatt hours. So that's... Uh, that's the deal here. And, and as I kind of gave away this already, but the ending note here, the reality check is to date, these have been built at experimental scale only, but not yet at commercial scale, since they're typically very large, tall structures to ensure a good temperature differential. Thus, capital costs are high and they're viewed as risky right now. But you know, I believe this maybe, is the uh, largest yeah. uh, solar updraft tower that they've created so far. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's for, great. For anyone out there just listening, it's about three tin cans and a piece of paper on top. Um, so, but but yeah, no. I, I, just when you Google solar updraft towers, you know yes, they have all yes. these uh, 3D generated images and exactly, and designs, but has not been created at scale yet. So. But I like the one you're showing there. It says yeah. build your own solar updraft <laughs> tower. That'd be a fun project. <laughs> yeah, good, good for the kids. Good for the kids. Yes, so, yes. <laughs> so, so there you go. No, no, but it's uh, it, it's definitely a different kind of technology. And <laughs> really, you know, if you have a lot of undeveloped land, and you know, I'm not saying desert is useless. It, it's its own environment. It's its own ecosystem. But if you want to turn it into something, Ralph, like it's not like it's taking up a river. It's not like it's, you know, being put on shoreline or coastline. It is simply out in the middle of desert, which would normally be, uh, again, not useless, but at least not as no, useful yeah, for people. So, yeah. So yeah. there you go. It's a, it's a good idea to use in a large area that would otherwise go un, un, underutilized, maybe. So yeah. story number three, uh, very mm -hmm. cool. Story number four. We'll go ahead and, uh, well, this one is, uh, you know, I think for electronics and interfacing with, like, the human body and skin. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Anyone who's been to a hospital, they know that, you know, Technology's gotten a lot better, but at the end of the day, it's still kind of just wrap it with a bandage, wrap it with a cloth, wrap it with a band-aid, <laughs> whatever it may be, and just stick it to the skin. Uh, I guess story number four is looking for maybe a little bit different way. You know, not not you know, it will have medical applications, but really all applications yes. for uh, for this technology. So yeah, exactly. And this story comes from New Scientist, and the headline here was "Stretchy Electronic Skin Responds to Touch and Pressure." like real skin. And usually what Ben and I do is we end our Friday segments with a story that in general terms re references medical technology. And this this does, because this could have profound implications for prosthetics and so forth, as we'll get into here in a moment. So this is a great way to not only end today's show, but to end this year of coverage on another positive, upbeat note here about where technology is taking us into the future. So researchers at Stanford University in California 
have developed a patch of artificial skin that can convert signals from pressure or heat sensors into brain signals. Touching this electronic skin after it was connected to a rat's brain spurred the rat to kick its leg. We'll explain more about this in a moment. This could be used to improve prosthetics for people who have skin damage. So folks who have, you know, large scale skin damage or, or maybe their hands were burned and so forth and they, they can't feel anymore. Mm -hmm. This might be something that could help them out. The Stanford research, research team has created a device they call eSkin, E-Skin, out of an electronic circuit and pressure and temperature sensors, all crafted out of a thin and stretchy rubber, rubbery material. And if you have the show notes and come out and get the show notes, if you're listening to us as a podcast, you can see how incredibly thin it's on the uh, finger, index finger of a person here. And, and my gosh, it's Almost just like, like saran wrap. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, yes, it is like saran wrap. It's that thin. It just blows my mind. So let's see here, it goes on to say, the Stanford team merged these components into one patch that easily conforms to uneven surfaces such as a human finger. E-skin works by imitating biological skin where nerves detect pressure or warmth and then send sequences of electronic signals or pulse trains to the brain. Hmm. And, when it, and when it was heated or when pressure was applied to it, the e-skin's sensors sent signals to into the circuit, which converted them into pulse trains. And I have a link to in the show notes to learn more about what pulse trains are. And to do this, the e-skin needed only up to one sixtieth of the voltage used by older to date artificial skin devices. Wow, one sixtieth of the energy as compared to current artificial skin devices. Wow, this could mean. The e-skin won't heat up as much, making it more comfortable for longer use. Any artificial skin that could be used as a prosthetic for people with skin injuries needs to be comfortable enough to wear for a long time. Makes sense. Skin sensations can trigger quick muscle movements. So the researchers connected the e-skin to the nervous system of a living rat Thank you, pigs, mice, and rats for all of your contributions. <laughs> so they connected the e-skin to the nervous system of a living rat to see whether it could do something similar. The team connected the electrodes in a patch of e-skin into the region of the rat's brain that processes touch and temperature. They then put the pressure on the device. The rat's brain reacted by firing more signals between neurons in the region that controls movement. When the researchers routed those signals into the rat's leg through an, an insertable artificial synapse device, it kicked. What? In the show notes, if you want to learn about synapse, I had to get a little refresher myself. It's got a, a little definition and some links in there as well. So, reality check. According to the ex. Uh, Pardon me, according to an expert at Northwestern University in Massachusetts who looked at this research, he said, quote, this is a clear demonstration. Based on sensation, there were movements. And this is not a small thing. It's quite challenging work to get the electronics to work well enough for this. However, the e-skin may need even more sophisticated circuitry to be used in place of uh, large areas of skin. So what this fellow was saying is it's a great advancement. It's got great implications. A lot of more work is needed to be done because if you want to upscale this to cover maybe someone who's lost um, sensation in their entire hand yeah. or um, part of their arm or whatever the case may be, you need to get more research. But what a great I, optimistic yeah. beginning of this technology. I, I, and, and and really, I could think of, you know, so many situations where or like not even like replacing, you know, like a chunk of skin or something like that, but maybe put that on a prosthetic leg, for instance. And that mm -hmm, way, you mm -hmm. know, like if uh, I, I, I think a lot of people that are, you know, just have, you know, just have everything, they kind of realize that, you know, if they feel like a draft on their left arm, they know someone may have just walked by them. They know if they feel mm -hmm. heat on mm -hmm. their leg that, you know, that mm -hmm. they're sitting in the sun or something like that. If you could just put this on a prosthetic leg, a prosthetic arm, you know, some kind of prosthesis and get that sensation of just something, uh, that's going to make your prosthetic feel like, you know, a part of you and, you know, something much yeah. more natural. So yeah. even that yeah. is, is just going to be such a huge benefit. And, you know, the fact that the, that the, the rat, you know, essentially they put, they press this little thin membrane and the rat, you know, was able to feel it that, that just 
blows my mind. Mind blowing. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> it does. It's it, crazy. <laughs> it is. It's very, very cool. So with that being said, very, very cool story and a lot of great implications for, you know, a, a lot of different use cases, you know, more than I'm sure yes. Ralph and I just, just said here. So very nice, upbeat story to kind of end on. But for those out there who are checking out the show notes, you may notice that there's a whole section called honorable mentions, and these are not participation awards. Uh, trust me, there's tons of news stories out there that uh, don't get the, you know, that don't get honorable mentions. But these are at least some stories that Ralph has picked through. And Ralph, you've really decided that, you know, even though we don't have time because we stick to four stories, uh, people should still hear about these, right? Absolutely. Yeah, this is like bonus uh, at the end of the show here for you to go and check out and hopefully a motivation to come out and get the show notes. So first one, really interesting from interestingengineering.com. Great outlet. Headline, General Electric Aerospace Cracks Hypersonic Engine Test claims 4,000 miles per hour achievable with this new uh, aircraft engine they've come up with. And it's a very complex and detailed story. Check it out. They've General got Electric. multiple sources for this too. Yeah. Making hypersonic jets, but still can't figure out an ice maker that won't break. I don't know how they do it. Good for GE. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I bet the division of GE that did this engine is a little more sophisticated. <laughs> I would hope so, because they're ice makers. Mm, mm. Yeah. And then another one here, uh, which kind of sort of relates to our, our final story today. Uh, headline here, Robotic Third Arm controlled by breathing is surprisingly easy to use wow controlled by comes breathing from new science. Hmm. yeah robots or pardon me the story here comes from new scientists and this one you really have to um dive into it because the headline alone makes you go what what are we third <laughs> arm what are we talking why would i need a third well third arm is is great for something like surgery uh, for a surgeon to have another appendage so to speak so there's a lot of cool implications just, from, that story. just from like kind of yeah. glossing over the text it looks like the researcher yeah. said two arm good three arm better and there yeah. you go they're, they're kind of running with yeah. that isn't that interesting mm -hmm. yes so, and then the last one here, uh, the growing field of fungus in low carbon sustainable building materials. So it's talking about this whole trend to look at alternatives for building materials from traditional ones like steel and concrete and so forth. And fungus, Ben, you know this, over the last couple of years, we've had multiple stories where people are messing around with growing materials that could be used for construction. Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting story. I recommend you check that out as well. And with right. that... There's another year in the can. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Everyone, us, I, I, and, and, and Ralph, especially, I want to thank you so much for, you know, kind yeah. of spending 2023 with us and looking forward to 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we say that because this will be kind of the last show that we have with Ralph uh, before the end of the year, because again, last week off, but we'll be back, uh, you know, doing, doing the same thing in January. So ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you have a great break, a great Christmas, a great uh, Hanukkah's already over, I think, but uh, you know, just everything and anything else, uh, Christmas Hanukkah Kwanzaa that you do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll meet you back here after the new year. And uh, yeah, everyone, be happy, be well, do all that good stuff, and check out ComputerAmerica.com for any updates, show notes, anything, all that, and more. ComputerAmerica.com. And Ralph, once again, thank you so much. We'll catch you in the new year. All right, everyone, have a great one. See you next time. Bye bye.